Hello and welcome to Charles Kelly Money Tips. Good to see you again. Uh, hi to everyone on Facebook Live and thanks for, for tuning in and you know li taking part and, and your comments and everything. So th thanks for that. Great to see you all. And thank you for my podcast listeners who tune in uh, via iTunes and Stitcher and th through my website moneytipsdaily.com. Uh, today you probably heard if you're in the UK that uh, another chain of shops, this time Mothercare, uh, is in trouble and it looks like they've gone into administration which means they're not quite bust but they, they can't meet their their commitments their debt repayments or whatever it is so the administrators have taken over and that means that their their business is ring fenced for the time being until it's either sold off broken up or, or whatever um, but the landlords will be taking a hit now because they will not be getting their rent and there are about 79 stores up and down the country that um, where the landlords will not get their money. Now you might say, well, you know, so what? But that landlord could be your pension fund. It could be your insurance company that is paying out on your policy. So it, it has a, an effect on all of us one way or another. It could be a council, it could be your local authority. Uh, but Mothercare, you know, once they had, I think it was like 400 stores all over the country, they were uh, a, a magnificent business in their in their heyday. They were the, they were a unique type of business. They started up this business, I, I think, going back to the seventies, late sixties, and they were just everywhere. But in recent years, they've gone out of favour. They, they they perhaps have not renewed themselves. They've not kept up to date. They're falling behind with the competition, and this is what can happen to to businesses after many years of trading successfully, they can just go into this gradual decline. And we've seen that happen with some of the department stores. Um, now, they'll, that's not just Mothercare, of course. I mean, it will be the 36th chain to fall this year. 36 chains of stores, not just little stores. And I believe up until June of this year, there were something like 2,800 stores uh, or shops and stores that have closed down in the UK alone. And I think the same thing's happening in other countries as well. It's not just here. Um, and, you know, 1,600 stores, uh, 42,000 staff have been affected by the, these, these large stores closing down. So it's, it's a big employer, the, the retail sector. And, and, you know, we know that uh, the Amazon effect and the, the online shopping effect is, is having uh, a, a devastating effect on, on, the, on the high street. And of course, if we continue to ignore the shops or we continue to just go in there and sort of look at stuff and say, well, I can buy that two pound cheaper and wait for three days for it right? going on Amazon. Well, then, yeah, th these stores are, are not going to be there. So as I said in a previous episode, you either use them or lose them. And once you lose them, that's probably it forever. But I think with, with um, Mother Care, it probably goes a bit deeper than just Amazon. It's more of a decline in the store and the management and everything. It's just perhaps uh, badly run. Uh, so we, we have to see, see how that develops. But I, I would suggest you've got to use the store and, or, or lose them. And as you know, in the UK, we're going through an election period now. There will be an election on December, December the 12th. And there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Uh, we don't know which kind of government we'll have. We might have another hung parliament where we have a coalition government. They may block Brexit. If the Tories win, then black Brexit will almost certainly go through. But if, if they don't, then we may end up with an extended stay where we don't leave the European Union at all um, or we end up with a different deal. So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and I think this is creating uncertainty in the business community. However, the, the stock market seems to be ignoring this and they're just going up and, you know, it's all uh, business as usual with the stock market. But I, I don't see how that can be the case. I mean, the US stock market, I think, reached record levels the other day and how can this be when there's so much uncertainty in the world? There's still the China-Trump trade war. Um, that there's lots of countries are, are are looking at you know huge demonstrations as people revolt in the Middle East, in Hong Kong, and in other countries where there's there's just a lot of uncertainty. And there's still the the underlying problems that were created from from the the last financial crash that have not been sorted out yet, and and yet. The markets just seem to go up and up and up and everyone seems to just carry on. And, and you know, you've got these stockbrokers like Charles Schwab, one of the, the big stockbrokers in, in America, saying uh, markets go up and down, but you should just sit there through throughout the, the storms and you shouldn't just sell when prices go down. He even says, I, he said something like, I would like to tie investors to a chair to stop them selling. 
Um, so, so they're happy because the, the stockbrokers, of course, get paid uh, whether you make money or not. They're getting paid on the trading, on the, the fund charges and that sort of thing. Um, and these fund managers and stockbrokers get paid anyway, whether you win or lose. Uh, so I, I, I think it, for me, it's not a great time to go into investing in the stock market. Even property prices are, are, are still high, even though they've dropped in the last couple of years. There's still a lot of uncertainty in the property market as well. Uh, so I, I'd just be careful and cautious about what happens over the, over the next few months. And, and, and wait and see. Obviously, if you find bargains in the market, you find a bargain company that's worth buying, go, go ahead. But you've really got to know what you're doing in this market. We can't just assume that, you know, you buy a share and it just goes up and up or continues to pay those dividends. Meanwhile, McDonald's seem to be seem to be doing OK, but their share price has dropped due to this uncertainty with its chief executive, who has been uh, Mr. Easterbrook who's a Watford-born guy who worked his way up from the shop floor, from working in the store, to the chief executive of the whole of McDonald's, which is remarkable. I know that they do promote from within, but, you know, you wouldn't expect that a guy could go from a shop floor manager on minimum wage or shop floor work on minimum wage up to 12 million a year uh, as a chief executive of the company. But he has fallen foul of the company's non-fraternization policy. That's a good American term, non-fraternization uh, where he's got involved with a, a lady from the, the business and, and they've got rid of him. So he, he's out, but he, I think he's going to get quite a big severance package of you know, millions, maybe 21 million, they, the papers are saying. But did you know that it's 79 years since McDonald first opened? Uh, they've got 38,000 restaurants around the world and they employ uh, 120,000 people in the UK alone and 1 million around the world. So, so UK is quite a significant part of, of their business, which, which surprised me, actually. I, I thought there were much, you know, it was more America. But, you know, you go around the world, you, you can all see a McDonald's. There's even a, a formula for working out um, the economy by basing it on the price of a Big Mac and the hourly rate of the worker that makes the Big Mac and how many hours a, a worker on minimum wage in that country has to work before they can afford a Big Mac. Now, in poorer countries, you might have to work two or three hours uh, on, on the wage there. Like like the Philippines, you might have to work three hours on, on the minimum wage there to buy a Big Mac. Uh, whereas in the UK, of course, you know, I don't know what a Big Mac costs, but, you know, with a minimum wage nearing nine, ten pounds, you know, you can easily afford two, back, two Big Macs, you know, for that. So... It, it's just interesting to, to see, and that's just one you know, economic formula of the Big Mac formula. But, uh, you know, th this company actually makes, uh, sells, have sold 400 billion burgers, 60 million customers are served uh, every day uh, in, in the world. So, so it's a fantastic uh, company. Uh, and 93% of the restaurants are, of course, franchises. So a lot of them are small businesses, but they work very much to a system. And, you know, if you want to study franchises, then study the, the Ray Kroc system of, of franchising that, that, that's worked so brilliantly well. Um, and, of course, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway is a big investor in companies like McDonald's and uh, Coca-Cola, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're kind of linked in their, in their business partnerships. So it, it's considered a staple, to use the word, a staple diet of the investment world, McDonald's. Um, but... Anyway, uh, he, he's out now, Mr. Easterbrook. He's been there 25 years um, and, and he earns 12 million a year running the company. So in, in the UK, they serve three and a half million customers every day, McDonald's. So, that, so they're doing quite well. Um, I, I'm not saying I'm a great fan of, of McDonald's, but, you know, they're always there. When, when you go there, you know what to expect and you've got the drive in and all that sort of thing. So uh, that, that's great. And it's, it's interesting restaurants, when you go into restaurants and, and they say, would you like extra this? Would you like that extra topping? Would you like, and you think, well, you know, why are they bothering with these small extra toppings? You know, and, and you sometimes say to yourself, well, is it, does it really make much difference, uh, th these extra bits and pieces? Well, there's a story in the paper today that Ryanair makes 7 million a year, you know, just on these little extras, just on just by charging these little extras. So when you go into Ryanair, you see a cheap flight, but then you have to pay extra for so many things, like reserving a seat from three pounds. Now, if you want a good seat, it could be 20, 30 pounds. On EasyJet, I booked a flight recently. It was 30 pounds to get a seat with extra legroom and speedy boarding. 
Priority boarding with Ryanair, five to fourteen pounds. Check-in bags. I mean, they charge ten to seventeen pounds for a ten kilo check-in bag, and a twenty kilo bag costs from twenty-five to thirty-five pounds just to check in a bag. And then they complain about people bringing in luggage on the flight and you know, all fighting for storage space to get their luggage in and squeezing luggage in and the, the staff looking stressed. Well, if they didn't charge to, to check the bags in so much anyway, maybe more people would check their bags in. Uh, but that, that's what it is. I suppose it costs them money to load the bags. So they look at every penny, don't they? They've really dissected it down to every penny. Replacement boarding card, £20. A name change fee, £115. I mean, sometimes it's best to abandon the flight than, than change the name, like a flight change fee, 35 to £65. Sometimes it's cheaper just to abandon the flight. You know, they won't give you any extras. It's impossible to get through to them. So, I mean, much as we may dislike Ryanair and EasyJet, well, I don't dislike EasyJet. I, I think Ryanair, I find their site difficult to use. Uh, there's all these extras you have to... Uh, to just to, to not have insurance is a hassle to find how you uncheck the insurance and then answer, answering to do it. if you don't have insurance you're at risk it's really pushing you into buying things uh, almost by implied consent uh, not selecting it but deselecting the insurance option uh, but you know these airlines have brought down the cost of uh, flying and they've certainly taken the monopoly away from the the big carriers where you know if you wanted to fly to Ireland you had British Airways and Aer Lingus and you know in the in the 70s I think my very first flight 1977 78 something like that as a child a very first flight I, I believe that cost 140 pounds just to fly from London to Dublin well you know all right it's a return flight but that's a long time ago and uh, now you, you can often fly there for 20 pounds one way uh, it, it, and it's crazy that the prices, when the two airlines had that monopoly, of course, that monopoly is broken. And you've got these airlines now offering direct flights, scheduled airline flights uh, all over the all over Europe and, and sometimes all over the world. It has brought the prices down. So they make their money by adding on these little extra top ups. And, and EasyJet, I remember, was the first airline that I'd used to book a flight online. And I was amazed how easy it was compared to, say, the British Airways uh, website at that time the, the easyjet was was so well designed so these extras think about that in your business you know can you make a bit more money by having upsells and little extras um, you know when, when my son was a student he was a manager at uh, Domino's Pizza and uh, he, he worked there for a couple of years on the weekends and he, he said that every time they sold a top in of 30 or 40 or 50 pence, just little extra toppings or, or, or the, the, these extras that go on pizzas, it, it could you know, increase their profits by 30, 40% on, on that pizza just by adding those little extras. So you may think that why are Ryanair messing around with three pound for this and five pound for that, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference to the profit because they're covered on the bottom line uh, with, with the basic price, but every extra is just pure profit. So think about that in your business when you're making an offering. Think about having a good deal, but then offering little extras that can, can that can make you money. Because Ryanair uh, and, and EasyJet seem to have mastered this, and they do make they do make profits. They've had trouble this year because of the Boeing situation and these planes, uh, but in general they've been a very profitable airline, and they seem to know how to make money. So, so there you go. That's it. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks, thanks for people tuning in there. Hi to everyone on, on Facebook Live. Thank you very much. And I, I, I'm off to a seminar this week uh, at my, my sort of monthly mastermind group where I'll be looking into more ways of buying property with no money down. That is uh, using creative strategies, lease options, rent-to-rent -rent strategies, and um, delayed completions to make money without uh, using my own money. Because the biggest dilemma for property investors is raising deposits. It's paying stamp duty because, you know, if you complete on a property today and sell it tomorrow, you're going to be hit with massive stamp duty and, and as well as capital gains tax if you sell it tomorrow at a profit. But you don't need to do that. There are ways of, of, of buying and selling a property without completing and without paying that, that stamp duty uh, by completing. So you can learn all these strategies. If you're interested in these things, then do drop me a line, charles at charleskelly.net, uh, or just, just send me a, a messenger message on Facebook Messenger, 
or whatever, or check out my website, moneytipsdaily.com, uh, and learn how to, to buy things without using your own money. Because very wealthy people like Rockefeller, for instance, who was possibly the richest man of all time when you, you, you build in inflation, um, he controlled the oil refinery uh, market and in, in America. And he said something along the lines of, you know, you don't need to own things, you just need to control them. And, and, and that's often very true in property. Uh, you, you don't, building managers, for instance, if you own a building and, and you sell off these long leases, you sold off the flats, but you're still in control of them. Uh, it, and it, Duke of Westminster, he sells off all his properties, but he's still in control because the leases eventually come back to them and they control the area through their, their leases. So there's lots of ways of owning property, controlling property, making money from property, income from property, becoming financially free, even if you have no money of your own. Because everyone thinks we to get into property, you have to have money. You have to have loads of money. People say money goes to money. Only people with money can make money. It's just not true. Because if that were the case, poor people would never become rich. And, and most millionaires are self-made people. They're, they don't just come with the silver spoon ball in their mouth. So, so do get in touch if you're interested in learning these strategies charles at charleskelly.net or of course on on facebook messenger so thanks for listening this is charles kelly bringing you money tips to help you save earn invest accumulate and enjoy more money just a reminder on on to, to my facebook live group um that uh, just just to tell you a bit more about myself in case you, you you've never come across me before i i spent 25 years in financial services I work for banks, insurance companies, and uh, I had my own brokerage. I had my own IFA practice. And that gave me a, a big insight into people and money and money management. And I, I, I saw thousands of customers over the years. And that prompted me to write the book, uh, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness. Because a lot of people say things like, oh, money can't buy you happiness. And you know, money doesn't matter. And you can be laissez-faire about money. You know what? what's money anyway and this sort of thing and I say that that is nonsense money can buy people happiness and does buy people happiness you tell that to someone who hasn't got anything to eat and say oh money doesn't buy you happiness you know you'll be happy in heaven or you'll be happy if you just meditate and say om and all this sort of stuff uh, because you don't need money to be happy yes I've got loads of money but it doesn't make me happy no, you don't need money. You're, you're poor. Your your reward will come in heaven. Well, sorry, that's not just not true. Um, money is a tool. Money is a means of exchange. It, it replaced bartering as a means of exchange, where bartering was, you know, I'll do this job for you if you do just this job for me, and I'll swap this farm produce for something else. Um, no, money replaced that as a, as a currency, a way of uh, providing for services, paying for services and moving money around the world quicker than you could do through bartering. That, that's all money is. Yes, money in itself, if you put money in your hand, yes, it's exciting, the feel of money and the touch of money. But yeah, that doesn't particularly buy you, make you, you happy. But it's the things that money can buy that can make you happy. I mean, I, I talk about money all the time and through my podcast and in, in my book, but I'm not really that much of a materialistic person. Uh, you know, I don't crave to, to buy faster cars or um, I, I don't crave to buy more clothes all the time or jewellery. I don't even wear a watch. I haven't got a Rolex. Um, I, I don't really crave those material things. Um, you know, yes, I like to have nice holidays. I like to, to go to nice places. I like to travel in style, but I don't necessarily crave the material things that you, you, you might think because I talk about money. But what, what money can give you, uh, for me, is more important. It's things like security and knowing that you've, you've got a roof over your head, knowing that you've got income coming in, financial freedom, knowing that you can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. Uh, you know, long-term security, knowing that even if you get sick uh, or you can't work anymore, that there's money there, that, that, that there's capital there. That, that's what money does for me. Money also means I can help other people. I can be a part of Rotary Club, for instance, and, and help people less fortunate than myself. And, you know, that, that also gives you a certain form of satisfaction as well. But money to me uh, gives me those things and that makes me happy. And knowing that, you know, if I get sick and, uh, you know, the NHS can't treat me, I, I can get treatment, I can pay for treatment. 
I have, and, and money gives you that, that, that peace of mind, if you like. So it's peace of mind, it's freedom, it's security. It, it's all those things. Not necessarily that I want money so I can go out and buy a Rolex watch. I don't want a Rolex watch. I don't want to have the responsibility of wearing a big chunky Rolex watch. It doesn't, doesn't appeal to me at all. I don't need you know, a £2,000 suit from, from Savile Row. Uh, I, I don't need to buy a Ferrari to be happy. I don't even want a Ferrari. I, I've got an old second-hand car. That's fine for me. It gets me from A to B. Uh, but I like to have a nice place to live. And, and I do like to, to travel. I was in uh, Paris uh, last week. It, it's nice to be able to say, well, I would like to upgrade to business class. And then you get your meal included. You can change your ticket at a moment's notice, which I did on the way back. You know, you can have a little lounge where you get to the station. You board at the front of the train. You get a bit of service on there. Or, you know, on a plane, you, you get to sleep on the plane rather than putting in cattle class. Yes, that, that, that's material things, I suppose. But that, that's more about having comfort and convenience and those sort of things rather than just uh, buying the latest watch or the latest gadget. Uh, I'm, so I'm not that materialistic. But so I, 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 that, that's what money can, can do for you. It can give you that bit of happiness through additional security. It can give you happiness through knowing that you know, you, you've got money there, whatever happens, knowing that you don't need to go to work nine to five for the rest of your life because you're financially free. And that's what I, I write about in the book. It's about money mindset. It's about how to make money uh, go further for you, how to, to save money, how to manage your money, which is very important that you have the peace of mind knowing that you, you, you're managing money and how to make a bit more money, uh, you know, without uh, necessarily just thinking about a job. Because I, believe me, millions of people are, uh, will, will be either retiring broke or not be able to afford to retire. Uh, and, and I learned this in my financial services day that only a small percentage of people who work all their life will end up wealthy or well off or able to retire, uh, you know, without living on the state or without, um, you know, perhaps living from their relatives or or, or being in, in financial difficulty. So. A lot of people in this country will be retiring or, or unable to either retiring in poverty or just unable to retire because they haven't put enough money aside or because they find that the pension that they thought they were going to get from the company wasn't enough or the pension they thought they were going to, going to get from the, the state, from the government, is not enough. Well, I can tell you now, you don't need to wait till you retire. The pension you get from the government is not going to be enough. It, it's barely enough now to, to exist on let alone live comfortably and travel and do all the things you want to do in retirement. And in the past, most people in most jobs had a company, a good final salary company pension scheme. Now, these schemes have been phased out long, a long time ago. So really now, only people who work in government jobs or for a select few companies are in what's called a final salary guaranteed pension scheme, guaranteed to give you a pension, whatever the stock market is doing. So not many people have that guarantee. If you work for the civil service, you're a nurse, you're a government worker, um, you're, you're a policeman, MP, the, the, these kind of jobs, you will get uh, a final salary pension. Teachers get them as, as well. But the rest of us will be in what's called money purchase pension schemes, which can go up or down with, with, with the stock market. And most people in those schemes are not saving nearly enough to retire on. So... You know, you, you've got to think about this. Think about what you're going to have when, when you retire. Now, if you're young, you're probably saying to yourself, oh, that's 40 years away. I don't need to worry about that. What, what's, you know, let's enjoy life, man. Let's go out and get drunk. You know, don't worry about retirement. You know, screw retirement. I, I, I don't need to worry about that. That's a long way away. But believe me, it soon creeps up on you. You know, if you're in your 30s or 40s, you, you may be going through that phase where you're, most of your money is going on your children and your mortgage. But it's still a time to think, well, I should be putting something aside for the future. Because when you get to your 50s, then unfortunately it becomes very, very difficult. Because, you know, if you look at a graph uh, from here to here over, uh, say, 40 years, it's quite a smooth ride up, isn't it? It's, but as you get nearer, it becomes steeper to reach that point. So if, that's, if this is your retirement point and you're going to reach it from here to there, it's a smooth run up. It's a, it's a gentle uphill walk. But the nearer you get to it, it becomes steeper, right? And when you leave it to there, 
then you're, you're almost climbing up a mountain to save enough money to retire on. So don't leave it to the last minute. And if you have left it to the last minute, then you're probably not going to be able to save enough money in your pension scheme. So you, maybe you have to look at other ways of retiring. Maybe you, you might look at a business on the side. Maybe you'll get into property, do property investment as a, as a method and a means to retire on. Maybe you need to learn about the stock market. So you do your own investment directly into the stock market. But whatever it is, I think do look at it um, because, uh, as I said, most people, probably four out of five people, 80 percent of people will, will not be able to retire. And I've heard this figure in America as well, will not be able to afford to retire. And I don't want to be one of those guys you see in a supermarket car park pushing 50 trolleys around, you know, in, in my 70s and 80s. I don't know how they do it. I, I push one trolley and it's hard enough. He's pushing 50 and steering them around the cars. So I, if you don't want to be like that, then find a way of funding for your retirement. And if you're not saving for your retirement now, go and see your financial advisor. Uh, I'm not your financial advisor. Uh, and, and you've got to take your own financial advice and, and look for how you can uh, provide for your retirement. Personally, I, I like to invest myself. I like to invest in property. I like to learn about investment and, and to do it properly, which is why I'm suggesting, even if you haven't got any money uh, and, and you want more information on how to buy property with no money down and get into property without using your own money, then do contact me because I can put you in touch with a very useful course. Some of them, do they, they do a free taster course so you can learn in a couple of days various strategies on how to get into property uh, with, without using your own money. And that could be a lifesaver for some people because maybe they haven't even saved enough to, to buy a, a small property. So why not use the strategies where you can own and control property using none of your own money? And there are lots of strategies. Believe me, it's not pie in the sky. Um, I'm, I'm using them right now. So, so to do contact me, charles at charleskelly.net or, or check out my uh, messenger on, through Facebook through, through here and uh, just, just drop me a line and I'll put you in touch with them uh, because I, I'm not running these courses myself, by the way. Um, I, I haven't really got time to run these courses, but I'll put you in touch with experts who are running very, very good courses and can, can certainly get you started. And I know young people now that you know had no money. They, they had a job and they've done this whilst they're still working. They've, they've gone out and just on, in their evenings and weekends, they've found property deals. They found ways of making money with, from them without using their own money. There, there are lots of strategies. I know young people who are racing ahead now and doing really well. And, you know, I've got to admire the way they've, they've done this just in their spare time. So some of them have kept a part-time job. Some of them have kept a full-time job and, and they're doing it on the side. Some have been able to retire from their full job, full-time job within six months to a year using the, the same strategy. So, so it does work. And, and that's I, I think, you know, that's why I, I'm recommending these courses, because I think that they're good for you. And, you know, what have you got to lose? Some of these are, are free taster days. So you lose a time going to a course for a day that, um, you know, maybe on a weekend. So you can either do that or you can stay in and watch Columbo or you can go down the pub or something. But uh, I think it's a good time to, to, to use your time and, and go and learn about these courses so that you can get into property even if you have none of your own money. And even if you have your own money, I still think you should find out more about these strategies so you don't just use up all your money in one property deal and then it's all tied up in that property and you, you may not have even got a good deal there. So, so do learn about these strategies because, uh, and, and also you get to network with other people who are like-minded that are also uh, thinking along the same lines as you. Some of them are you know, broke, they've got no money at all. Others, you'll find that have got money. There may be people you can joint venture with because they're, they, they, they've got their time poor but cash rich. They haven't got the time to, to, to find deals themselves, so they'll pay people to find deals for them. That's called, uh, it's a form of deal packaging. It's a form of J, JV and jo joint venturing. There are lots of ways of making money without necessarily having all the money yourself. So think about that. Just, just contact me, charles at charleskelly.net or on Facebook Messenger. So thanks for listening, and um, thanks for tuning in on, on Facebook Live. Hi there to, to Dave, uh, old friend of mine, and thanks, thanks for everyone, and I will speak to you again soon.